Despite my voice that is not dependable, I'm going to try narrating our diagram for Lesson 15. It begins by looking a little differently. We have the line of salvation history now shoved up into the middle of the page. And our explosive shape for God now reads the Holy Spirit, that mysterious person of the Trinity. Because of all the stories that we have in this early part of the Bible, this one displays the elements of the Holy Spirit that we won't actually know about until Pentecost and after. Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the breath or the wind. The Hebrew word would be ruah, which we'll now add to our vocabulary. So on this diagram, up in the left-hand corner, we re-diagram um, that little emblem that we used from the beginning of three trinities. God the Father, God the Son, held in union by the Holy Spirit, the third person. Man and woman held in union, this is in perfection before the fall, by the power and love of the Spirit of Unity, the Holy Spirit. And the greatest miracle of all, God binding man to himself in perfection by the Holy Spirit of God the third and most remarkable trinity. And from this perfection, mankind chose to go its own way, rather eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil than accepting God's good. And we have that jagged falling away, the loss of the Holy Spirit, falling down, into the need for salvation history. Now, if we look at that box below, we see the evidence of the fall that is so prevalent in this book of Judges. We can't comprehend these weird stories. There's Jephthah's being raised by the Holy Spirit as a judge of Israel, and ending by sacrificing his own child. This is the creeping evidence of the Canaanite religion upon the people of Israel. If others must sacrifice a child to, to seal some act of God, what more can Jephthah do but the same? Then there's the evidence of Ephraim's jealousy and bullying. But worse, the Gibeon offense with the rape and murder of the concubine, calling all Israel up into war against the Benjaminites, doing away with almost all of the um, warriors of Benjamin, except for 600, I believe it was, and then refusing to give them wives, um, the whole story of how to make up for that by the theft of women, it's just ridiculous. Then there's the relocation of the Danites. They are pressured by the Philistines out of their territories, they end up by going north, but they swipe some idols and a priest of idolatry to take with them and set it up in their new location, which will be Dan in the north. That idolatry will not go away. 
So aside from all this, we do see that there are Nazarite vows which will impact Samson. And we'll look at him a little later. But against all this evidence of the fall, the Holy Spirit is still at work, bringing salvation history along into the 1100s where we are now at the time of the Judges and heading onward to the time when Jesus will be manifested as the um, third person or the second person of the Trinity and through his death and resurrection the Holy Spirit will be given to the church at Pentecost with all the attributes of the wind, the Holy Spirit will be given to the church at Pentecost. So then let's look at what the Holy Spirit does. Well, it animates, it gives life. It is the spirit of creativity. It sustains life. The Holy Spirit inspires the thought and will of man. And it's the spiritual element of man even as we see it here in Judges. Despite all of the sin, despite all of the offenses against God, the Holy Spirit is at work. But in such a strange way, Ways that we don't expect. It has all the attributes of wind. Think of it. The Holy Spirit is not controlled by human beings ever. It comes and it goes. Even in our own lives we experience it. It's intermittent. It passes. We depend upon it. But it is a force that moves things but it's an unseen force. It comes from different directions, even in our own life. We don't know what to expect, except that it is of God, and it is good. So even though we uh, um, we are weak against its power, we cannot control it, still we find it both strong enough to move us, but also very soft and soothing and caressing when we need it. But it's everywhere at once. The strong Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity, meant to unite us to God and, of course, to each other, especially in marriage. So though it's wild and untamed, it is nevertheless the source of reason and intellect. It is love. We often think of love in much too soft a way. So we expect when the Holy Spirit enters strongly in, it's like the wind. It scatters our expectations and sets them up anew. So, Lord Jesus, give us the power of the Holy Spirit when we need it so badly. So, let's look at the main character here in Judges, such an unruly person. There are four different levels in which we look at Samson. The first is the historical record. Of course, he is a historical man. He lived on this earth in the area that is described in the scriptures around the city of Timnah. Everything that is described is known now through archaeology to be accurate to the area of Timnah. Actually, um, I was on a dig there, and a house was discovered in the ruins that had been burned, 
which makes you wonder about the house that Samson burned down with his father-in-law and his ex-wife. So, yes, it is historical. And in the historical level, what is this man Samson like? Oh, my word. Isn't he sensual? Irresponsible? He says to his father about this woman, Get her for me. That's just ridiculous. He has and no, no religious concern that we can put our finger on. Very low standards. He's almost a brute. He kills without any uh, compunction whatsoever. So that's the historical level. It is a true history of a man. But then there are added to that some legendary aspects that must have been added in the retelling of this dynamic but brutal man. Some legendary facts that we could hardly put together in our heads, like foxes, tails being tied together and things of that kind. Sort of like uh, the ba- uh, the uh, story of uh, the blue ox and whatever his name was. We, we recognize some of those legends. But on top of that, there's a Jewish religious emphasis is why it's in the Bible. Because it's a pattern of the Exodus. When God raises up a charismatic leader, this one doesn't obey any law of holiness, but he is raised up to deliver the people from evil after they have repented. So that the old Exodus pattern over all of these um, judges, so-called, is there saying that God delivers. God delivers from evil. God delivers from oppression. So we have that Jewish religious level. But then we have the level of the Holy Spirit. Strangely enough, talk about blowing away our categories. It surely does. Because in a certain sense, and this takes some imagination, but it is the way the Holy Spirit works. Samson prefigures our Lord Jesus. You say, what? How can that be? Well, look at the facts. He is announced by an angel visitor, first to a woman, then to her husband. And the barren woman conceives miraculously and bears a son. He is brought forward or manifested at a wedding feast. Recall that Jesus' first miracle is at a wedding. Manifested at a wedding. My word. But the man speaks in riddles. How many of the parables were understood by the disciples? They had to ask him in secret, What did you mean? Exactly. Oh, Samson, you speak in riddles. And it's only your wife that you will tell the meaning. And what is this riddle? It's about a lion, a dead lion out of whose body comes sweetness. Who is the Lion of Judah? Our Lord Jesus. He is the Lion of Judah. Out of his body, we Catholics are blessed with sweetness. He loves harlots. Oh, goodness gracious. This Samson and his harlots. This Jesus and his harlots. Who are they? Well, of course, he loved the prostitutes in his own day. Not in any sensual or sexual way. 
but in the way of salvation. And who are his harlots now? Who are those of us who only partially give our love to him and our love to lots of other things? That's us. Lord, have mercy. He loves harlots. And he punishes the oppressors. Yes, he does. He frees from their control, just as Jesus does from the garden in Gethsemane on. The oppressors are put aside, and his beloved are freed from their control. But his lover betrays him. That's us, but it's also those dear beloved disciples who weren't there when he needed them. Peter and, well, first of all, of course, Judas. But then Peter, who says he never knew him. And do we betray him? Oh, Lord, have mercy on us. But he is betrayed. But nevertheless, he tears down the enemy's gates of hell. He plunders the enemy, rising on the third day. And even though the Spirit left him on the cross when made him vulnerable to death, even though he was tortured and mocked, he gave up his life and overcame evil. These are the, what, the, this is an outline, shall we say, of the life of Samson. But there is something missing from Samson. Jesus rose from the dead. But isn't it an amazing thing that something so ridiculous could be seen as foreshadowing something that will happen years and years ahead. The very prefigurement of our Lord. Well, it's quite an idea of how the Holy Spirit can scatter our categories, our prim, neat ideas, and overlay them with something so powerfully true and rich. <laughs>